Today's sermon is brought to us by Pastor Mike Moses. We hope that you are uplifted and encouraged by this wonderful sermon. The next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. And one of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus, and Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. The next day, Jesus decided to go to Galilee. He found Philip and said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter, and Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him, of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said to him, Come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Father, we thank you for your word, for the power of your word, for the clarity of your word, for the truth of your word. And we thank you for the way that it testifies to your son, Jesus Christ, all that he is, all that he has done for us. We thank you for the privilege of gathering together in this place under the sound of your word. And we do believe, Lord, that your word does not return void but it accomplishes the thing that you send it to do. And so we pray today that as we consider this wonderful passage of Scripture, that you would glorify yourself by revealing to us the truth of who your Son is and by stirring hearts to be open and receptive to all that you are and all that that means for our lives. Lord, even as this passage points us to the truth of your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that we would be stirred and prompted to point others toward him as well. So honor yourself, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats, and I invite you to turn with me to the Gospel of John, chapter 1. The Gospel of John, chapter 1. Well, as we continue our series verse by verse through the Gospel of John, we have come now to the end of John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51, in a message titled, Pointing to Jesus. Pointing to Jesus. Many years ago, back in 2005, to be specific, I came across a very interesting Associated Press article uh, reporting from Istanbul, Turkey. It was so uh, alarming to me, and uh, not alarming in the sense of uh, having any sort of personal trouble related to it, but alarming in the sense that, well, you'll, you'll understand as I read the article. Reporting from Istanbul, Turkey, the article reads, First one sheep jumped to its death, Then stunned Turkish shepherds who had left the herd to graze while they had breakfast watched as nearly 1,500 other sheep followed, each leaping off the same cliff, Turkish media reported. In the end, 450 
dead animals lay on top of one another in a billowy white pile. See, I thought there were 1,500. Yes, the article reports that those who jumped later were saved as the pile got higher and the fall more cushioned. 1,500 sheep followed one another in jumping off a cliff. I thought it was satire at first, so I looked up the sources, and yes, this appears to be something that actually took place back in 2005 in Turkey. 1,500 sheep following one another in jumping off the same cliff. Clearly, these sheep were very effective in influencing one another for the worse. And this happens between people, doesn't it? We do influence one another, sometimes for the worse, potentially for the better, depending on what we are influencing one another toward. There are those who have the opportunity for a broader influence among people. I'm thinking of the recent phenomenon of the social media influencer. Many of you know what I'm talking about. Someone who has such a following on their social media page that if they recommend a certain product, thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people will buy that product because they look to this influencer and are affected by what they have to say. There's also a direct influence that any of us are capable of, word of mouth recommendations. You go to a new restaurant in the area, you enjoy it, what do you do? You tell a friend about it, and that friend is likely to try it based on your direct recommendation. We influence one another, for better or for worse, passively or actively. And the encouragement of our text for us today is that we would use Whatever influence we have toward others, use that influence to point to Jesus. Use your influence to point others to Jesus. We see this happening time and again in our text today. First, we will see this in verses 35 through 39 as we see John pointing his disciples to Jesus. This is the first example we see. John points his disciples to Jesus. Notice again verse 35, the next day again, John was standing with two of his disciples. We talked last week a lot about John the Baptist and about his popularity as a baptizer and a preacher of repentance, preparing the way for the Messiah. The crowds were flocking to him, and not just crowds, but there were specific individuals who were attaching themselves to him and his teaching to be John's disciples. Now, a disciple in this day was more than a student that showed up to a 50-minute class two or three times a week. A disciple is someone who would attach themselves to a teacher, not only to hear their words, but to see their example and to imbibe their entire lifestyle and influence. John had a number of these disciples, but notice what he says to these two disciples, specifically in verse 36. He looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, behold, the Lamb of God. Now, this phrase is very familiar to you who were here last week, the previous day, in the previous passage. John said, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And we talk about everything that meant. So you say, why is it that the very next day, John is repeating himself with the same phrase? Well, sometimes preachers need to say the same thing more than once in order for it to sink in. And this time it sinks in. This time, these two disciples get the idea that not only is Jesus the Lamb of God, but he is the one they should be following. He is the one they should be attaching themselves to. Notice verse 37. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. See, John the Baptist had prepared his disciples well. He knew that his ministry toward them was not to be permanent, but was a temporary stewardship. And eventually, they would be handed off to Jesus. This is the perspective that a parent is to have, right? You understand that those children you are raising in your home, although they will always be your children, and you certainly hope to always have a relationship and influence toward them, they are in your home under your direct care and oversight just for a couple of decades. 
and there comes a point where they're ready to transition into adulthood and you send them out into the world, having prepared them, hopefully, having prepared them well for that moment. John knew that his influence on his disciples was a temporary stewardship. It was not as if he would never see them or talk to them again, but their primary influence now was to be Jesus himself. And again, we see such amazing humility in this. He must increase, but I must decrease. John was the forerunner. He was the opening act, but now he steps into the background intentionally so that the main act may take the stage. And so now we see this transition in verse 38. Jesus steps back. John steps back. Jesus steps forward. Verse 38, Jesus turned and saw these two disciples following and said to them, what are you seeking? What are you seeking? It's a good question, isn't it? It's a profound question. I believe the author John includes this question to not just tell us historically what happened, but to also provoke us as readers to consider what are we seeking? As we come to Jesus Christ, you've showed up today for a reason. What is it you are seeking in gathering around the teaching of God's word about Jesus Christ? What are you looking for in that? You looking for something interesting to do on a Sunday morning? You looking for a social group to connect with? Do you have a sense that you need to check off a particular religious box and so you're doing that duty by gathering here today? Is it something deeper you're seeking? Are you looking for happiness? Are you looking for fulfillment? Are you looking for significance? Are you looking for freedom from guilt and shame? Are you, are you looking for Jesus as a means toward another ultimate priority or Are you seeking Jesus as an end in and of himself? See, Jesus does provide happiness and significance and fulfillment and freedom, but he does that as a secondary result. The primary purpose of us seeking Jesus should be to seek Jesus. Not only the good things that he provides for us, but Jesus himself is what we should be seeking. And so I love the response that is given here as verse 38 continues. And in response to his question, what are you seeking? They said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? Now I read some scholars this week commenting on this verse who who actually believe this was somewhat of a lame answer. Uh, Why would you answer a question with a question? It doesn't seem to have anything to do with Jesus' question, what are you seeking? But I'm persuaded this is actually a great response to Jesus' question. Because what these disciples are saying in response to the question, what are you seeking? They are saying, we are seeking you. Where you are, we want to be. So where are you staying? We would love to stay with you, to learn from you, to see your example. I love that response. That should be our response as well. What are you seeking? You should be seeking to be where Jesus is. And one reason I believe that John is pointing toward this is because the same term that is used here, translated here with the word staying, is the term meno, which is translated later in John 15 with the word abide. To abide means to remain or to stay. And Jesus says, abide with me, in me. And I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, neither can you unless you remain, abide, stay with me. I think it's a great response these disciples have. And Jesus has a gracious response now to their inquiry in verse 39. He said to them, come and you will see. And so they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day for it was about the 10th hour. 
What a gracious invitation of Jesus to respond to their desire to be with him and to say, yes, come with me, be with me, learn from me, see my example. Can you imagine the conversations that day as Jesus revealed to these inquirers all that he was? What a privilege this is. I mean, to merely hear about Jesus is an amazing privilege. To be pardoned by him is astonishing. To have a home in heaven is incredible. But to be with him, nothing is better than that. Nothing. Thomas Akempis wrote, what can the world offer you without Jesus? To be without Jesus is hell most grievous, but to be with Jesus is to know the sweetness of heaven. And whoever finds Jesus finds a rich treasure and a good above every good. I hope we can see from the example of these disciples that yes, we should seek Jesus, but not as a means towards something else, but as an end in and of himself. So what a service Jesus did for his disciples in pointing them to Jesus. How about you? Are there some in your life who look up to your influence, whose, whose ears you have even if you don't have a broad influence at this point in your life, there have got to be at least a person or two or three who are impacted by your words and by your example. How can you use your influence this week to point someone to Jesus? Again, I'll mention social media, not because it's real life, and some of you don't engage with it at all, which is just fine, but if you do, it just so happens that a lot of us do spend a lot of our time there for better or for worse. So let me ask you a question. If someone were to stumble upon your Facebook page, your Instagram account, how far would they have to scroll before realizing you are a Christian? I know that people use social media for many different reasons. Some of you are just on there to see pictures of your grandkids. Others of you just like sharing funny memes, and that's fine. But if we are motivated to share a funny meme, to tell someone about a new restaurant we came across, to let people know why we like this politician and don't like that politician, surely we can take some time to share about the one who died and arose for us for our eternal life. Amen? How can you use your influence to point to Jesus this week? Social media, of course, is not the only way. I only use that as one example. I love how John points his disciples to Jesus. And now number two, as we continue into verses 40 through 42, we see one of those disciples, Andrew, turning and pointing a family member to Jesus. Andrew points his family to Jesus. Oh, family dynamics can be interesting, can't they? Um, I'm so thankful that as an adult, I really do have a good relationship with all of my siblings, but just several weeks ago over the Christmas break, I was reminiscing with my older brother about some rather animated spats that we got into in our younger years. I reminded him of the time that I was laying on a sled and he pushed it backward into a crowded parking lot and I cut the top of my head open on a a hubcap. And he said, uh, yeah, I remember that. Sorry about that. Um, but do you remember, Mike, the time that you were so angry at me, you grabbed a glass snow globe and smashed it over my head? And, and I said, oh, yeah, I think I do recall a little something about that moment. Yes, I, I haven't made a habit of that in my life. I was quite young, but yes, I do believe I did that to my older brother on one occasion. Family relationships can be interesting. We can only imagine the, the background of, of Andrew and his brother, Simon Peter. Notice verse 40. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. Now, by the time of the writing of this gospel, Simon Peter would have been very well known. His brother Andrew, not quite so much, but Andrew was actually the first one to meet Jesus. And I love how immediately he turns around, verse 41, and he first, he made it a priority. He first found his own brother, who was just known as Simon at the time, and said to him, we have found the Messiah. And John here gives the Greek translation. It means Christ in English. That means anointed one. Verse 42, so he brought 
Andrew brought Simon to Jesus, and Jesus looked at Simon and said, you are Simon, the son of John. And yes, there's another John in our text. We know there's the author John, John the Baptist. Now there's John, the father of Simon and Andrew. You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas. And here again, he gives the Greek translation. That means Peter. You say, well, I'm familiar with the name Peter, but I don't actually know what Cephas or Peter means. Well, in English, this means rock. That's the meaning of Cephas, the meaning of Peter. It means rock. Here, Jesus, as soon as he meets Simon, gives him this nickname, and so much of Simon's future was contained in that name. We can think of the way that Simon Peter had such a foundational role in the founding of the church. But what I love about this moment is that Peter was not always solid like a rock, not from the beginning. In fact, as we read the story of Peter in the Gospels, we see that he is often impulsive, unstable. He was surprisingly fearful, by the way. Yes, he had a very bold exterior, but as often is the case, despite that bold exterior, he was terrified to suffer for Jesus. But despite the fact that he was not anywhere close to being fully and consistently a rock at this time, I love that this is an example, that Jesus saw him not for who he was to begin with, but for what he would make him to be. And that's an encouragement to my heart. I hope it is for yours, that Jesus sees us not for who we are now, but for what he will make us to be. The whole Christian life is a process of becoming what God has already declared us to be in Christ. There are so many different personalities in this text, and of course, we just have time to touch upon them, but I was so encouraged this week as I looked at these different personalities and how they may relate to us, because the more people change, the more they remain the same. Personality profiles haven't changed much over 2,000 years. We've talked about Peter a little bit, but going back to Andrew, I hope you're encouraged by Andrew's personality as well. The snapshot that we get of this man Andrew in the Gospels is that he didn't appear to be a gifted leader or speaker. In fact, there were two sets of brothers who came to Jesus early on, Peter and Andrew and James and John, and out of those four men, Andrew was the only one left out of the inner circle of three. We always hear about Peter, James, and John, don't we? What about Andrew? In fact, Peter, James, and John got some cool nicknames. Peter called the rock, right? James and John, the sons of thunder. And then there's just, just little old Andrew, no cool nickname. He didn't seem to be a, a leader type, and yet he is a wonderful example for us if we do take note of the few times he is mentioned in the Gospels. He is always bringing someone to Jesus. Always bringing someone to Jesus. And I love that. Not a gifted speaker, not a gifted leader of crowds of people, but faithful in his own quiet way to bring people to Jesus. I have often observed that sometimes Christians who are not gifted as public speakers or overseers of a congregation are often the most effective personal evangelists, faithful, one-on-one, -on -one, to tell those in their lives about Jesus. Maybe that's you. I hope you're encouraged today by the example of Andrew and encouraged by the fact that you never know that one person that you tell in your quiet way may be the one to turn around and tell thousands. This was the case as Andrew told Peter, who was the gifted leader, who was the gifted speaker. And we can imagine that moment early in the book of Acts when Peter preached and 3,000 came to faith in Christ. And you can just picture Andrew smiling and being thankful to the Lord for the role that he had in that. One small spark can light a blaze. 
Some of you may remember uh, years ago watching the Summer Olympics in Barcelona in 1992. I was just a boy at the time, but I loved watching the Summer Olympics, and I will never forget a particular moment that happened during the opening ceremonies. For the most part, opening ceremonies are just weird and a waste of time, in my opinion, but I will never forget this particular moment, and some of you may remember it as well. As the Olympic torch made its way, having relayed all around the country of Spain, it, it was run into Barcelona and then into the Olympic Stadium, and finally the Olympic flame arrived at a professional archer. And the end of his arrow was lit with the Olympic flame. And he turned toward the giant cauldron at the end of a crowded stadium. And, and this was a mesmerizing moment. That professional archer launched that flaming arrow toward that giant cauldron. And it was a perfect shot right over that cauldron. And you just see this little flame flying through the air. And boom, there goes that huge Olympic cauldron. It was a mesmerizing, incredible moment. I remember it well all these years later. A small flame lighting a huge torch. And though you may not be outspoken, though you may not be extroverted, though you may never be the kind of person to get up in front of a crowd, you could light the world on fire through your faithful witness one by one by one. In Andrew's case, it was his brother. Who is it in your family that you could point toward Jesus this week? Is there a brother or sister who doesn't know Christ? Perhaps a mom or a dad who doesn't know Christ. I have known many occasions, it's a beautiful thing, where it was actually an adult child who led mom or dad to the Lord. It's a beautiful thing when that happens. Is there an uncle or an aunt, a cousin, whom you could speak to this week? Certainly, parents, you have an incredible opportunity in your home with your children to point them toward Jesus Christ. I would imagine if I asked for a show of hands, how many of you were led to Jesus by mom or dad, it would probably be the vast majority of us. Parents, do not discount the wonderful opportunity you have moment by moment, day after day, to point your children to Jesus, hopefully through your good example and especially through your words. Point your family to Jesus. Number three, number three, we meet another man in this text, Philip, who points his friend to Jesus. This is the focus of verses 43 through 46. Philip pointing his friend to Jesus. Verse 43, the next day Jesus decided to go to Galilee. And what did Jesus do? He found a man named Philip, and he said to him, follow me. Now, I was interested to learn this week that typically at this time, it was disciples who would seek out a rabbi to follow. It was very rare for the rabbi, the teacher, to be the one seeking out a disciple. And yet this is what Jesus did in this case. It was Jesus who sought out the disciple. And on an ultimate level, this is always how it is. In fact, Jesus made it very clear in John 15, 16. He told his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Amen. He is the initiator. He gets the credit for anything good that happens in and through our lives because he chose us first. We give him all the glory. Notice now down in verse 45, Philip in turn finds a friend of his named Nathaniel. Uh, this is likely the man who is known in Matthew, Mark, and Luke as Bartholomew, his family name. Quite likely, Nathaniel was his personal name. Philip finds Nathaniel and says to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of of Joseph. Now, 
Of course, that last phrase is only partially correct. Jesus was the adopted son of Joseph. We know from elsewhere in Scripture that Jesus is the Son of God, that he was born of a virgin, conceived with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is the Son of God, not the biological son of Joseph, and yet he was the adopted son of Joseph, and this did put him within the line of kings of Israel, notably. We'll come back to that in a little bit, but but the thing I want us to really note in this verse is the statement, him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. And we will see this, by the way, time and time again as we journey through the Gospel of John. The author is constantly pointing us to the fact that Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, which, by the way, is the reason that if anyone ever counsels you to unhitch from the Old Testament, that is very bad advice because you can't unhitch from the Old Testament without unhitching from Jesus and half of the New Testament. He is the fulfillment of the Old Testament scriptures. J.C. Ryle wrote this, Christ is the sum and substance of the Old Testament. To him, the earliest promises pointed in the days of Adam and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. To him, every sacrifice pointed in the ceremonial worship appointed at Mount Sinai. Of him, every high priest was a type and every part of the tabernacle was a shadow and every judge and deliverer of Israel was a figure. He was the prophet like unto Moses, whom the Lord promised to send, and the king of the house of David, who came to be David's Lord as well as son. He was the son of the virgin and the lamb foretold by Isaiah, the righteous branch mentioned by Jeremiah, the true shepherd foreseen by Ezekiel, the messenger of the covenant promised by Malachi, and the Messiah, who according to Daniel was to be cut off, though not not for himself. The further we read in the Old Testament, the clearer do we find the testimony about Christ. And what a moment when Philip says to his friend, we have found him. Centuries in the making, we have found him. And yet Nathaniel wasn't quite ready to fully believe this. The picture we get of Nathaniel in this text is that Nathaniel was, was a straight shooter. He did not like being deceived. He did not like fake news. And perhaps even as a devout Israelite, he had been jaded by false claim after false claim of false messiahs who had arisen recently. And so he doesn't respond with excitement. In fact, he latches on to Philip's statement about Jesus being of Nazareth. And notice what he says here in verse 46. Nathanael said to him, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, now why would he say something that really seems quite rude, to be honest. Well, well, we know that Nathaniel grew up uh, very close to Nazareth, and and maybe there's a reference here to a a local city rivalry. You know, the way that two neighboring communities may tease one another in anticipation of the annual rival high school football game between uh, the community schools. Or perhaps even a University of Michigan fan might speak of someone from Ohio and say, can anything good come out of Columbus? I, 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 I hate to admit, but I have known a few good people at least come out of Columbus. And, and we say that teasingly, right, as a matter of, of local rivalry. But, but, but there seems to be something more here to Nathaniel's statement and most to believe that, that the problem he had with, with the Messiah coming from Nazareth is that Nazareth seemed to be such an obscure location, not directly spoken about by the prophets. Now, we know that even though Jesus grew up in Nazareth, that he was in fact born in Bethlehem, which was a direct fulfillment of the prophecy of Micah 5, verse 2. But Philip doesn't get into all that at this point. He keeps it very simple. Notice what he says at the end of verse 46. Philip said to him, come and see. I love the simplicity of that. 
Because as you seek to point your friends to Jesus, you will find that some of them, like Nathaniel, may initially have a skeptical response. And I do believe there is a place for apologetical arguments. I do believe there is a place for philosophical reasonings to break down the barriers and the presuppositions that are mounted against Jesus. But having said that, I think the best and most effective thing you can do is to simply say, come and see. Come and behold him. Read read one of the gospels with me. Why don't you come, friend, and worship Jesus with me? Observe what he is doing in my life and the lives of other believers. Just just come and see. And the Lord can use that. I believe he will primarily use that because if he is lifted high in people's sight, he will draw men to himself. Which of your friends could you point toward Jesus this week? To whom could you say, come, come and see the one who has changed my life and my eternity? Again, I believe that John is writing these things for us not only as a matter of historical record, but to prompt us to know and be reminded that we are part of this story. We are the next generation in witnesses of Jesus. It started back then, but it should be continuing in our day. Now it is our turn to be the witnesses and to point those around us to Jesus. I shared this past Tuesday at our congregational meeting that this is our theme for the year based on the Gospel of John. Jesus says in John 17 that as he was sent into the world, so he sends us into the world proactively with the light of the gospel that shines into the darkness and the darkness does not comprehend it. And all of us have the opportunity and privilege and responsibility to be a part of that, not just the professionals. I was reading uh, something by John MacArthur this week and uh, this was notable in light of the message I was preparing. He wrote, Most people don't come to Christ in response to a sermon they hear in a crowded setting. They come to Christ because of the influence of an individual. In fact, in the overwhelming majority of new believers' testimonies, they tell us they came to Christ primarily because of the witness of a coworker, a neighbor, a relative, or a friend. The most effective way of bringing people to Christ is one at a time individual to individual. I was so encouraged recently to have two different ladies from our congregation approach me and ask for prayer specifically with regard to an evangelistic opportunity. One one lady with her husband shared with me that they are continuing to minister and have a relationship with one of the refugee families that we began focusing on almost a year ago. And not only has that relationship continued, but she said they they have become increasingly open to Jesus and and believing the gospel of Jesus. And would you pray that we, we see this come to full fruition? What a joy it was to hear that and to lift that up to the Lord. Another lady approached me about an opportunity with a coworker, and she said, I think I'm making progress in my conversations about Jesus with my coworker. Would you pray that my coworker would receive Jesus Christ? I'm so encouraged by those conversations. That's where it's at, is each one of us who knows and loves Jesus turning around and simply telling someone else. And, and to ultimately trust God with the results and the timing of that because it won't usually be a situation where just one conversation does it. Usually there are several over the course of time and you simply speak faithfully of Jesus and trust that his word will not return void. Many years ago, I worked as a security guard while going through my seminary program and um, 
it was very quiet late at night, not much to do, and it uh, was a great opportunity to, to talk with my coworkers and to, to do what I could to influence them toward Jesus. I really enjoyed talking to one particular coworker who was right around my age, his name is Matt, and uh, we, we loved talking about Detroit sports and how bad all the teams were, and we loved talking about life, and, and just, a, just a nice guy, not hard to talk to at all, and, and whenever I could, I would, I would talk to him about Jesus, and he wasn't hostile toward Jesus, but at that point in his life, it was just very clear that he preferred a life of sin rather than believing in Christ and all that that entails. And so eventually we went our own separate directions in life, and it wasn't until several years later that he reached out to contact me and, and said, hey, Mike, it's been a while since, since we talked, but I thought I'd share a few things with you. He said, I'm living in Texas now. I just got married, and uh, we'd love to start a family soon, and, and that really prompted me to, to, to really think I should start taking my relationship with God seriously. He said, I remember all those conversations we used to have about Jesus back in the security guard booth, and, and he said, you'll be happy to know I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. And he said, you know, I'm coming back to Michigan for a, a short visit here soon. I'd love to get together with you, get some lunch, catch up. And he said, could you take me to a bookstore to help me pick out a Bible to read? <laughs> and, and, and that was one of the most wonderful messages I have ever received. God was faithful to use my simple and imperfect witness to draw a soul to himself. And he can use you that way as well. We've seen disciples pointed to Jesus. We've seen a family member pointed to Jesus. We've seen a friend pointed to Jesus. But, but where does Jesus point them? We see now as this passage concludes in verses 47 through 51, point number four, that Jesus points us to heaven. <laughs> this is why we point people to Jesus, because Jesus points us to heaven. We continue looking at this short story involving this man, Nathaniel, who, as we've already seen, is a pretty straightforward guy, a generally honest guy, but, but had the posture of being quite skeptical. He was one of those people who had really neat and tidy boxes that everything fit very comfortably into until Jesus came and exploded those boxes. He tends to do that, doesn't he? Amen? And this is exactly what happens here in the case of Nathaniel. Notice verse 47 Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said to him behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit and Nathanael said to him how do you know me <laughs> I love just the straightforwardness of that response told you he was just a straight shooter right and Jesus answered him before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree I saw you now, there's a lot going on in these two verses. Certainly, we see a couple of indications in these verses that Jesus can see right into our hearts. That Jesus knows everything about us and about our lives. We see references to this all throughout the Gospels. But why is it that he mentions a fig tree here at the end of verse 48? What in the world was going on under that fig tree, and why was that a notable mention for Nathaniel? Well, uh, we don't really have any firm answers on this, but I did discover this week that back at this time, fig trees were known as places of Bible study, meditation, and prayer. And it's not unlikely that as a devout Israelite that he was under that fig tree meditating upon God's word. We might even speculate that he was considering some of the promises of the Messiah within God's word. Perhaps even praying that the Lord would bring those prophecies to fulfillment. We don't know that for sure. But whatever was going on in Nathaniel's heart and mind at that moment under the fig tree Jesus knew. And his reference to this was such that his supernatural knowledge was clear to Nathaniel and it overcame his posture of skepticism. What a turn we have here in verse 49 as the skeptic Nathaniel answers him, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. 
I love, by the way, that we can trace the titles given to Jesus in our passage and how they escalate. First the Lamb, then Teacher, then Messiah, and now Son of God, King of Israel. It was wonderful for Nathanael, who it's noted in verse 47 by Jesus himself. He is an Israelite indeed, an Israelite through and through, culturally, religiously, and with all the expectation of one who wanted the Messiah to come and be the king. Now, of course, at this time, this phrase, king of Israel, would have carried with it a lot of political expectation. Here they were under Roman occupation and they wanted the Messiah to come to be the conquering king of Israel who could free them and be their political liberator. This was the expectation of the crowd at the triumphal entry. Chapter 12, verse 13, they say, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. But how quickly the tide turned especially when Jesus made it clear that at this point he was not coming to establish his kingdom directly on earth and to reign directly on earth. That day will come. But he says in chapter 18, 35, my kingdom is not of this world. He had come at that time to be the sacrificial lamb of God to allow himself to be hung on a cross, to die, not for our political liberation, but for our liberation from sin. And so the sign on the cross read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. There's great irony in that. He came to his own. His own, by and large, did not receive him, but there were some who did. For example, Nathaniel. He bowed to his king. He believed in Jesus' name, and he received the right to become a child of God. I notice now Jesus' response in verse 50 to Nathaniel's confession that he is the Son of God, the King of Israel. Jesus answered him, Because I said to you, I saw you under the fig tree, Do you believe? You will see greater things than these. Says Nathaniel, you think that was cool? You ain't seen nothing yet. (laughs) And I love this because it should really whet our appetites for what is to follow in this story. But notice now verse 51. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, and here, by the way, the word you is plural. He is speaking not only now to Nathanael, but speaking to any who have ears. I say to you all, you will see heaven opened. With spiritual eyes of faith, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. This is a wonderful statement in and of itself, but there is a very clear reference here to an Old Testament passage of Scripture. All the way toward the beginning of the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, chapter 28. And I want to ask you to hold your place in John chapter 1, because I want you to see this for yourself in John, I'm sorry, in Genesis chapter 28. Please take a moment to turn there with me, uh, because I'm so excited about the connection here and what it is that Jesus is saying about himself based on this reference to Genesis 28. Genesis 28 is telling the story of a man named Jacob. Jacob, by the way, who was kind of a scoundrel, his name means deceiver or supplanter. His name was eventually changed to Israel. And it was his children who became the leaders of the 12 tribes of Israel. In fact, when Jesus calls Nathanael an Israelite indeed in whom there is no deceit, he's kind of saying, you are Israel and not Jacob. Really cool reference, kind of setting up already this more direct allusion to the life of Jacob. But, but notice verse uh, chapter 28, beginning in verse 10, tells the story of Jacob's ladder. Maybe you've heard of the the Jacob's Ladder toy, kind of an old school toy, really cool toy. How many of you had that growing up as kids? Yeah, those are cool. So this is where Jacob's Ladder got its name. Notice verse 10, Jacob left Beersheba and went toward Haran. This is quite a long journey, quite a turning point in his life. 
And he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. And taking one of the stones of the place, he put it under his head and lay down in that place to sleep with a stone as a pillow. Man, I envy this guy's ability to sleep in any circumstance. Wouldn't you like to be able to just fall asleep on a stone like this? It's amazing. You must have been exhausted. And notice verse 12. This is the key verse. And he dreamed, and behold, there was a ladder set up on the earth. Possibly a staircase or a ladder could be either one. And the top of that ladder reached to heaven, and behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and your offspring. That would become the land of Israel perhaps not far from the place where Jesus and Nathanael had their conversation all those years later. Notice verse 14, your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth and you shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south and in you and your offspring, the nation of Israel, notice, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Not only Jews, but Gentiles as well. What a promise. Verse 15, behold, I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place and I did not know it. And he was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God and this is the gate of of heaven. Now don't miss it. Back in verse 12, the angels of God were ascending and descending on what? On the ladder that reached up to heaven. Now with that in mind, let's come back to John chapter 1, verse 51, where Jesus says, you will see heaven opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on not a ladder, but on the Son of Man. What is Jesus saying here? It's quite clear. Jesus is saying, I am the ladder to heaven. I am the link between heaven and earth. And with eyes of faith, you will see that clearly, Jesus says, through what I do, through what I say, and especially at the end of the story, when I die and rise again. In Christ, heaven has come down to us so that we can be raised to heaven. He is that ladder. Hebrews 12 says, In Christ you have come to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and innumerable angels in festal gathering. Ephesians 1 says, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. And although we do not yet enjoy the full realities of heaven, Philippians 3 says, our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. And he can be that link, that unique link between earth and heaven because he is not only the son of God, as Nathaniel has acknowledged, but also because, as Jesus says of himself, he is also the son of man. Don't miss that there at the very end of verse 51. Jesus says, ascending and descending on the son of man. It's an interesting phrase. In fact, this was Jesus' most common title that he used for himself. 80 times in the four gospels, he calls himself the son of man. Now, if you know Daniel chapter seven, you know that son of man is a title of glory, but it was also a title of humanity and the capacity to even suffer as a man. 
Hebrews 2.14 says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same thing. The reason Jesus can be that ladder between heaven and earth is because he is son of God and son of man. Because he is fully man, he could be our substitute on the cross. And because he is fully God, his sacrifice is valuable enough to save not just one soul, but countless souls for all eternity. He is the ladder, the only ladder to heaven. No one comes to the Father but by him. I don't know if any of you have ever had the misfortune of suffering a ladder-related accident. I hope not. I've only had one ladder-related accident. Thankfully, it was not a serious one. It took place a couple of years ago as I was taking down my Christmas lights. (laughs) And I was in a hurry, and I set up that ladder in a new location there on my front deck, and and I wasn't careful. I had set one of the feet of that ladder on a patch of ice, and, and I was in a hurry, and I didn't notice. And I began climbing that ladder, and thankfully, I had not made it very far when, whoop, that ladder just slipped right out from under me, and instantly, I hit the deck. I literally hit the deck with my face. Now, like I said, thankfully, it wasn't the kind of serious injury that required me to be hospitalized or anything like that, but it hurt. I was quite sore for a while. And one of my little ones who had been standing not far away from me came up to me and, and, and he, was, he was afraid. He was bothered by what he had seen and he said, Daddy, you shouldn't have done that. <laughs> and I said, I know, <laughs> I'll try not to do it again. That was not a reliable ladder. Uh, But Jesus is. Jesus is. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, Christ Jesus. And this is why each and every one of us must use our influence to point to Jesus. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. No one comes to the Father except through him. Lord, would you use us just as you used John, Andrew, Philip, and so many to point others to Jesus. Would you use us as well? The story is not over. You are still bringing citizens into your kingdom. You are still pardoning rebels. You are still saving souls and you still do that through the faithful witness of a believer. Would you help us, Lord? Give us your strength. Would you give us clarity according to your word? Would you give us such compassion and love in our hearts for those around us who are lost and headed to an eternity apart from you? Would you stir in us to use our influence this week to point toward Jesus? We thank you, Lord, for sending us Jesus to be the way to heaven to be the bridge to eternal life. There is no way we could have climbed there on our own. Lord, we thank you for sending your son, Jesus, because you loved the world and you love us. We pray these things in Jesus' name.